The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. For those of you who are just joining us, uh, we or have been listening, you are listening to Restoration Radio. I'm one of your co-hosts, Stephen Heiner, um, along with Nicholas Wansbutter and Pierre Sugel. We're joined today by Bishop Donald Sanborn, and you, you'll hear Nicholas and Pierre both referring to His Excellency as either me Lord or uh, your Lordship or my Lord. Um, and this is from those terrible, horrible days when we had hierarchy, and there were titles that corresponded. So a bishop would correspond to a marquis, an earl, a viscount, a baron, whereas let's say an archbishop would correspond to a duke, and that's why you would refer to an archbishop as your grace instead of uh, my lord. Uh, And so you'll hear in our Commonwealth, uh, United Kingdom, and American hosts today a panoply of different ways of addressing um, the bishop. Uh, Again, today our show was um, is being sponsored, before we move on to our next document, it's being sponsored by Novus Ordo Watch. Um, And I'm going to read the next ad. Ever since the Second Vatican Council and the new mass of Paul VI, Catholics have seen the most horrendous sacrileges in their churches. Recovated buildings, desecrated sanctuaries, hideous tabernacles, black altars, plastic tables. Since Vatican II, Catholics have seen it all in their very own parishes around the globe. Role-playing, soccer liturgies, clowns and puppets, balloons, Halloween costumes, liturgical dancing, disco masses, half-naked participants, Freemasons wearing aprons, pornography shown from the pulpit, the priest riding into the sanctuary on a motorcycle. There is barely an aberration the Novus Ordo Church has not already thought of, performed, approved, or silently tolerated. But there is one website that monitors and exposes it all, Novus Ordo Watch. To learn the truth about the Vatican II Church and how it differs from the Catholic Church, log on to NovusOrdoWatch.org. That's NovusOrdoWatch.org, where the counterfeit church with its false teachings and impious practices have been exposed since 2002. I have the next document, Your Excellency, and it's Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. Sounds very official and very serious. Mm-hmm. And um, humorously, or perhaps, you know, a dark humor, uh, there is no dogmatic definition located within Lumen Gentium. It uses that language, that construct that we're familiar with, dogmatic constitution. But this, a lot of commentaries that I read um, on this document in preparation for the show refer to this document as a sort of charter for the council, that once the church rediscovered herself for the modern world, she was then able to talk about laity, bishops, etc. So this document in its own way is sort of a charter. And I thought it might be helpful to read both what an alleged Catholic and a, an admitted Protestant have to say about the document. Um, we have uh, Avery Dulles, um, who, uh, a Jesuit, uh, who commented that the first edition of the schema from 1962, quote, resembled the standard treatise on the church as found, for example, in most of the theological manuals published between the two world wars. Influenced by centuries of anti-Protestant polemics, the writers of this period placed heavy emphasis on the hierarchical and juridical aspects of the church, including the supremacy of the Pope. That's just terrible. Uh, And of course, this, this uh, this is something to be avoided. We hear the Protestant comment on this exact same document, um, a gentleman named Albert Utler, O-U-T-L-E-R, he says, Protestants and Anglicans who would have braced themselves defiantly before new animus, an, 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 anathemas in the vein of Trent will find little here that offends and much that edifies. Mm-hmm. Roman Catholics will find in this constitution a Magna Carta that will reshape many of their conventional notions about the church 
in her nature and mission, and that will furnish both inspiration and direction for their further experimentation and developments in the post-conciliar period that now begins. Um, of course, a Protestant giving a, a Catholic, um, you know, uh, news that now they'll be able to experiment with their church. I'm sure he's quite excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, before we, and one last thing before we dive into the document, Your Excellency, this vote on the final schema went 2,151 for, five against. And I looked for the names of those five bishops um, so I could see if they wrote anything else. But there's, a, there's at least five men who knew what was going on in this document. <laughs> but it's deplorable that there are only five. Five out of 2,000, right? Yes. Um, chapter 1, Section 3, Paragraph 1, refers to the church as mystery. Um, and I... I I'm not trying to oversimplify, again, as in the vein of uh, Dr. Hugel when he was asking about this, is that something that we traditionally understand about the church? Do we traditionally understand the church as a mystery? And what does that mean? The traditional theology of the church and the traditional dogma concerning the church never referred to it as a mystery. Uh, the, however, the modernists always refer to it as a mystery because the modernist uh, uh, wants to detach the notion of structure from the Catholic Church, actually from the Church of Christ. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the, that it is a corporate structure is something absolutely anathema to the modernist. So they had to give it names. Now, it's not to say that the church has supernatural mysteries concerning it. I mean, the the mystery of grace and the mystery of the priesthood and all of those are supernatural dogmas uh, that are very intimately involved with the church. The very nature of the church itself is, is a supernatural dogma and is a mystery. That is, we don't completely understand it. And, and sure, that's true. But here it is a catchword for the modernist idea of a structureless Church of Christ, which achieves structure only in certain human ways, and we'll we'll talk about that momentarily uh, as soon as you bring it up. Uh, that that is the key to this document: that the Church of Christ is an invisible spiritual thing uh, that is a mystery quote unquote. And then there's the Catholic Church, which is a structure. The as you pointed out, the Church of Christ, what is that? Very notoriously and perhaps most frequently commented on, um, we're gonna find in chapter one, section eight, paragraph two, um, the subsisted in um, passage, and I, because I don't want to just read one sentence, I'm going to read the whole paragraph. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the one Church of Christ, which in the Creed is professed as one holy Catholic and apostolic, which our Savior, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter to shepherd, and him and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of the truth. This church, constituted and organized in the world as a society, subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him, although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure, these elements as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. There's a lot here, Your Excellency. So I want to start with focusing on the phrase subsists in, and what, what does that mean? Can we interpret it in an orthodox manner? Um, is that normal to have to force yourself to interpret something in, in, a, in an orthodox manner within a Catholic document? Obviously not. Again, the councils are meant to clarify, not to confuse. And uh, the, uh, at, at very best, I mean, the very best interpretation you could give to this is that it it what what does it mean uh, uh it, it who knows what it means uh subsisted in uh, what do you mean by that that's the very best you could give to it it, it is obscure 
however, as I said, they meant a single thing by it. And if you look into the history of that document and the discussion concerning subsisted in, they purposely did not want to use the word est, which means in, or excuse me, which means is, the, the, which Pius XII used in his document concerning the church. Was this Mr. G. Corporation? Yes. Thing? And identifying the mystical body of Christ with the Roman Catholic Church, making absolutely no uh, distinctions. And they wanted to avoid that, the, the theolo theologians that, that contributed to this, and they proposed the subsisted in precisely to avoid the absolute identification between the Church of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church. That said, that we understand what they mean, and that is that the Church of Christ is bigger than the Roman Catholic Church. And that it does not have a visible structure itself, but it subsists in a visible structure. That is, it takes on an existence in, uh, if you understand subsist in its traditional terminology, uh, it takes on an existence in something else, that being the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, this interpretation is confirmed by the uh, by Dominus Jesus of Benedict the Sixteenth. Uh, well, uh, John Paul II, but Benedict wrote it when he was Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, the uh, saying that the Eastern churches, that means the Eastern schismatic groups, are particular churches, and that means that they are part of the Church of Christ. Uh, that they, uh, uh, but they don't have the fullness. That's what that's what that document says. But they are particular churches, and the traditional teaching concerning particular churches are dioceses that are communion with Rome. That is that is a particular church. When when Benedict or Ratzinger at the time uh, said that they are particular churches and that uh, they have uh, partial communion with the uh, Catholic. Uh, with, with the uh, Catholic Church, yes, and they are they are part of the Church of Christ, and uh, that when they have the Eucharist, the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church is present in them in all of its essential aspects. That's a, a quote from that document. You see that this is exactly what Lumen Gentium meant. I mean, there is an authentic interpretation of of the ecclesiology of Lumen Gentium. My Lord, I, I also read uh, in the answer to the main objections to Dominus Jesus when Benedict XVI, so called, uh, attempted to clarify exactly what it said in that document. And I'm just quoting from that. It says, and this is an attempt to prove that it is a traditional idea we must bear in mind. Quote, the concept expressed by is to be is far broader than that expressed by to subsist. To subsist is a very precise way of being. That is to be as a subject which exists in itself. Thus, the Council Fathers meant to say that the being of the Church as such is a broader entity than the Roman Catholic Church, but within the latter it acquires, in an incomparable way, the character of a true and proper subject, i.e. the Church of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church are not the same thing. Correct. Yes. It's clear. Precisely, yes. And, and uh, Ratzinger was again one of the prime movers of Lumen Gentium. Um, he... Um, uh, he was very much involved in that document, uh, and both his personal reflections on it are very important, and his uh, then John Paul II's promulgation of Dominus Jesus is also uh, very important uh, and, and decisive in the interpretation of that document. And so it is no, uh, you know, like uh, it's not a question of excited traditionalists who are, are saying that that document is false. And as it stands, and in accordance with what Ratzinger himself said about it, uh, it's heretical. And why is it heretical? Because it is contrary to the traditional teaching of one holy Catholic and apostolic church, which is in, which is in the Nicene Creed. And uh, it is contrary to the always understood meaning of that. And Pius X was very clear uh, in the anti-modernist oath that had to be taken, that the dogmas have to be understood in the sense that the church has always understood them. And what is typically modernist is to 
take the shell of the doctrine, to take the wording of the doctrine and say, oh, yes, I agree with that, but here's a new meaning for it. And so this document is heretical because it corrupts the traditional meaning of one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And and as I as I said, Your Excellency, there's this, these nods to other documents. So we covered in Sati's Red Integratio to start, and you'll see the nod to that document here within this paragraph where it says, although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure, these elements as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ are forces impelling toward Catholic unity, i.e. we don't have Catholic unity yet. And of course, that could be understood in its own orthodox way. If you try really hard, <laughs> like what the CCD did. Well, but if you, yeah, if you yeah, look yeah. at this, these notions of the exile church, the pilgrim church, we're working towards a unity. We will only get there at the end. But if we try really hard, um, can you comment a bit more on this, this notion of pilgrim exile church? And is that a traditional understanding? And if, if so, how have we understood it traditionally? Well, the Pilgrim Church and also People of God, which was another big theme in there, was a another modernist way in which to destructuralize the church and to detridentinize it. That means to take it out of the Tridentine period. Uh, and, you know, in a Pilgrim Church, uh, you walk from place to place and uh, things are different. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Benedict XVI compared it to a cruise, so an anchorage. And this, right, you can have a substantial in, anchorage here. We're going to stay yeah. here for a couple of days. Yes, and it's like a cruise in the Caribbean where you pull into this little island, you, you go off and you buy the trinkets of this little island, which are probably <laughs> made in China, and, and then you get back on the boat. The boat remains the same, so you have continuity because the, the boat remains the same, but you're going from place to place and you have different anchorages. So in a pilgrim church, the church is constantly changing and moving, and, and, and what you are today, you won't be tomorrow. Uh, Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, said that in uh, 1999, I think it was, about the papacy. He said, you know, we don't know what the papacy will become. We have no idea what the papacy will become. He said that in a speech. Yes, it's still, it's still evolving, right? Yes, it's still evolving. So, speaking, so speaking the, the continuity the for them is simply, simply a continuity of structure, that's all. Well, to take to, to piggyback onto that, Your Excellency, you talk about this evolving notion. So too, famously, this document needed a nota previa because its explanation of collegiality was so troublesome because it's evolving that the bishops share in the infallibility of the Pope when they're with him in a council. Um, and there had to be another document added onto Lumen Gentium to satisfy, I suppose, the, the Cardinal Ottaviani types who said, this is, this is heretical, you can't say this. Well, let me correct you on that. The, the bishops do share in his infallibility in a general council, in an ecumenical council. But the point is, and, and what was troubling, was the way that was worded in the, in the document, was that they have an authority apart from him, that the College of Bishops exists as a subject, and it even says is the subject of the supreme authority of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. That means uh, the, the, the Catholic Church is ruled by a college. Now, it just got finished saying the Pope is the head of the church, uh, because you always get a sandwich in, in Vatican II, you know, <laughs> yes. the previous paragraph. But the, that, that truth about the Pope does not redeem the heresy about the bishops. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any less heretical what you've just said about the bishops. Right, and, and it's the setup for the national conferences, is it not? Oh yes, definitely. That would come about. But you see that it's a whole new ecclesiology that you have. See, the traditional ecclesiology is that the Pope is, has all of the power received from Christ. The bishops have power over their flocks, their dioceses, from Christ, but through the Pope. That's Pius XII from Christ, but through the Pope. So they are truly the rulers of their dioceses by the power of Christ, but it's through the Pope. And the only time they have a, a shared supreme power with the Pope, with the Pope is in, a, in an ecumenical council, uh, but their, their power there again flows from the Pope uh, and, and is powered by the Pope, so to speak. They are nothing without him. 
They have no guarantee of infallibility without him. They could all err without him. And that's the traditional ecclesiology. But in this new ecclesiology, when you're consecrated a bishop, you become part of this college and you assume authority over the whole church in a collective way. So that, that changes the church from a, the, the monarchy uh, that Christ founded into a, a representative uh, sort of uh, republican government. Uh, and this is all done for the sake of ecumenism. Because as Paul VI said, the biggest obstacle to ecumenism is the papacy. So just as the mass had to go, so also the papacy had to go. And this this gives Protestants a, a way of of uh, seeing the papacy as reduced. Mm. Uh, and that's why you know people got really started to wring their hands over this one. And they did this nota previa, which oddly came at the end, even though it says a a, a previous <laughs> note, something that's right. supposed to come first. They put it at the end, and uh, they uh, they tried to fix it up. I I don't think that they fixed it up sufficiently. Uh, I mean, I don't see. But the point is that the nota previa uh, does not belong to the council. The document stands without it. And it was only something published by Cardinal Felici. You know, as is this note that was spread around by Cardinal Felici, it has no papal authority behind it. It, ha it has no conciliar authority behind it. It's a casual explanation. That's all it is. And, and that was pointed out by, because I think Ratzinger, uh, the story, I think Ratzinger was upset about it. And I think Kuhn said, don't worry about it. Uh, it doesn't belong to the council document, and that's true. It is not promulgated. <laughs> so some people could still be mollified by it, but it doesn't affect the the document right. itself. Right. It's a sugar coating to swallow the document. And there's more here to this document, Your Excellency, but we have to move on. We've got three more documents to cover. Thank you for continuing to just answer all of our questions without taking a break. We're all obviously taking breaks in between uh, the, the various documents that we're handling, but you have to keep going. Um, I'm going to uh, give you one of our questions from Twitter um, before we move on to our next document. For those of you who are just joining us, um, today's Restoration Radio episode is on the Second Vatican Council. We're halfway through. We've dealt with Unitatis Red Integratio, um, Gaudium et Spes, and Lumen Gentium. The next document we'll be talking about is Nostra Aetate, and our show today has been brought to you by Novus Ordo Watch. The question, Your Excellency, is, is the church a sacrament? Well, in the traditional theology and dogma of the Catholic Church, that never has been said. It was cooked up by Karl Rahner and by other modernist theologians. Uh, and again, it's one of those other attempts to disassociate the church from structure and call it by something different, uh, something invisible. Like communion was another big one. The church is a communion, and that is the new ecclesiology. The Church of Christ is a communion. And uh, and so sacrament, uh, I mean, could you make an argument that it that analogically it is a sign that gives grace? I think you could say that. You know, I, I don't think it offends any any Catholic theology to say that. But the point is it, that it it comes with baggage. That term, and the baggage is to to present the church the church as something that is not absolutely identified with the structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that, that's, uh, but I wouldn't call it heretical or, or you know, it's just a, a, a term of the new theology. Let's say. No, I, I think uh, your point's well taken, Your Excellency. It goes back to the people of God, you know, pilgrim church, you know, the church is a mystery, the church is a sacrament, and all of these, these weasel words that allow you to do different things. Yes, and, um, and the, the central heresy of this document, though, is the separation of the Church of Christ from the Roman Catholic Church as two different entities in the sense that they are not absolutely the same thing and that the Church of Christ is broader than the Roman Catholic Church. That is uh, a heresy. It is against the creed. That's very important to understand that. And every time you see them in the council and the, uh, the uh, John Paul II and so forth, referring to the church, 
without saying the Catholic Church, they are referring to the Church of Christ, this broad, invisible thing that all of these heretic schismatics belong to as particular churches in imperfect communion. That's what they're referring to when they say the church. If they say the Catholic Church, then they're 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 talking about uh, just the uh, the the structure. And that was uh, that heresy was made clear in the New Code of Canon Law in 1983, which made the distinction between in the Latin Christi fideles and Christi fideles catholici. In English, Christ faithful and Christ Catholic faithful. You have never seen that in the history of the church, any distinction like that. Not ever. Yes. And, and it shows that in certain cases, it's talking about all Christians in general, that is, those who all belong to the Church of Christ, and in certain other cases, only the Catholic Christians. That distinction is heretical. And Pius XII said that there, there, you cannot be a Christian unless you are Catholic. Well, Your Excellency, you're just not being fair. I mean, the Code of Canon Law is one of the fruits of the new springtime. I mean, I think you just you need you need to you need to understand it in a special way. Yeah, um, I have to get with it. <laughs> you have to get with it. And and with that, I'm going to uh, to hand the ball to uh, Pierce, um, Dr. Hugel, who's going to talk about Nostra Aetate. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank you, Your Excellency, and uh, thanks once again for for your great stamina in dealing with all of these uh, documents and our probings and questions. Right at the very beginning of the program, we were looking at the um, decree on ecumenism, uh, Unitatis Red Integratio. Uh, now we're going to look at Nostra Aetate, which is promulgated about a year afterwards, 28th of October 1965, and it's called in English, the Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions. Uh, the idea being that we now need to talk about how um, the church relates to other religions which don't have their origin in Christ in the way that those heretical and schismatic groups that are discussed in Unitatis Red Indigratio do. One of the things I noticed in, in reading the document is it's one of those ones where there's that kind of willingness of an, an oddity of expression, which makes it very difficult sometimes to, to get at what it is they're really trying to do. Yeah. I imagine that has something to do with the novelty of the subject. I just wanted absolutely. to... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, indeed. I wanted to go right in the very beginning and talk about something which I noticed that's odd um, at the start. It's interesting that in positing the unity of man, which is, of course, uh, what's behind this, this whole uh, document, and, and we're, we're dealing with uh, Dignitatis Humanae next, uh, they, they cite not the origin story of Genesis, but Acts 1726, which suggests not only that they distrust the traditional account, but also because it's followed by this strange uh, quotation, verse 17 of Acts 17, that they should seek God, if happily they may feel after him or find him, although he be not far from every one of us. That's from the Larry Reams translation. I thought this was interesting because it's not difficult to see how a modernist might interpret this line as a scriptural sanction of the origin of religion in a form of sensibility, which is the, the, the very core of the modernist heresy. We are united then, so the document suggests, because, quote, because all share a common destiny, namely God, end quote. In itself, this seemed to be uh, interpretable in a perfectly orthodox manner, but it also implies that all religions themselves contain this striving towards God, which is, appears to be positive in a sense on scriptural authority. Is that a fair assessment, do you think, my lord? Uh, yes, it's one of the main themes of modernism, if you read Pashendi, is that uh, there is uh, God is not merely naturally present to all things, which is of course true, but that he is supernaturally present in all people apart from grace. Uh, St. Pius X was very clear about that because he said, you know, if you're talking about grace, of course he's present by grace. But if you're removing grace from that, and these modernists are, this presence of God in all and this speaking of God in all men and so forth is is a very serious error. Uh, and But it's at the bottom of, of modernism. It's at the bottom of um, the new apologetics. Man has this need for God and, and – uh, and, you know, you, you, I don't want to say that uh, – uh, I don't want to say too much here in the sense it is true that naturally speaking, man can know God through reason. 
uh, that he has a, a natural longing for God to, to know him, to serve him. He wants to be good. That's all true in the natural order. Uh, and so, I mean, if that's all they mean, uh, then that, then it's all true. But it is wrong and very seriously wrong, and, and it confuses the supernatural and natural orders to say that God is speaking supernaturally to all men and is present supernaturally in all men apart from grace. That's a very serious error. It's condemned by St. Pius Yeah. I mean, I think a little later we get another thing which looks very suspicious in terms of heresy, because we read in the same opening section these words, quote, men look to their different religions for an answer to the unsolved riddles of human existence. Now, this might be criticized because it implies that these riddles have remained unsolved, whereas we know that the Catholic Church actually has the answer. But I wondered whether this could actually be taken in a, a harmless sense, that all men simply seek answers to the same riddles in their different religions. Uh, which is I think you could. You know, uh, I think it would you would be hard pressed to say that they meant that the Catholic faith did not solve those riddles. I, I don't really think they meant to say that. I, I think I'd be saying too much about the document. I don't think there's any evidence for that. I, I think that they're saying that to those people, life is a riddle and they look to vary their various religions to solve the riddle. I, I don't think there's really anything wrong with that. OK. Yeah, I and mean, that was my feeling too. Uh, the next, the, the text then goes on to just talk about some of the specific religions that it's dealing with. Um, rather than being outrightly heretical, at least as far as I can tell, the descriptions of Hinduism and Buddhism and other such religions in positive terms that contrast very strongly with the way in which previous ecclesiastical documents have described them seem to me simply erroneous or confused or wrong. Is the implied openness to what is positive in seeking after the good in, in these different religions enough to let these errors of expression off the hook, since we're talking here again about merely differences in perspective rather than actual the teaching? Yeah, sure. In that context, it, it's definitely modernist uh, to see uh, value in those religions. Uh, a religion can have the truth in, in two ways. One, it can have natural truths that it has deduced through reason. Another way is by borrowing or stealing truths from the Catholic faith. Those are the two ways in which it can arrive at truth. But it is, in all cases, mixed in with error, and in some cases, very serious error. And therefore, to say that there are, you know, you find certain truths in, in these false religions uh, is, well, of course you do. You find in practically any religion, you're going to find some truth. Uh, but it does not enhance them as religions, or it does not. <laughs> they're false religions. It's the wrong way. If you follow those religions in say, you go to hell. In, in itself, you go to hell. It's only through invincible ignorance that you could be excused from your sin of infidelity. But you are on the path to hell. You are on. You are in a crashing plane or a sinking ship. I mean, there. It, any false religion is a means of damnation. It is not a means of salvation. It has all the means at its, at its disposal to drag you to hell. I mean, because it's false. Uh, it is not a path to God. You know, so, it, you know, those paragraphs are indicative of a modernist spirit about these things, that there's a certain value in these religions. So there, there is no value. So what comes up in the following paragraphs is therefore much more difficult to read uh, in an orthodox manner, because we read there this, that the church, quote, rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. She should, therefore, quote, acknowledge, preserve and encourage the spiritual and moral truths found in them. Now, traditionists have found this as a refusal of the idea of active conversion. But could, nevertheless, we make an argument that what we're here talking about is the kind of active use of old elements in a culture? that is in the process of being converted. And I was thinking of, you know, St. Augustine of Canterbury constantly writing letters to St. Gregory, um, asking, you know, how to, to approach uh, the Anglo-Saxon converts he was trying to make, and, and, and Gregory telling him, well, you, you know, you can set up churches in the old temples and so on. Is this just about transition from, the, from, from a paganism to, to Catholic faith and employing old elements, reapplying them in a Catholic sense, or is something else going on? I think that in the context uh, of Vatican II and the context of ecumenism, uh, I think that it must be read in an unorthodox way. Uh, I don't think uh, we're talking about merely 
trying to capitalize on what is true in the various religions that that the missionaries encounter. And you, what you said is absolutely correct. The, the church has always bent over backwards to try to salvage what it could from those religions. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, that's supposedly the origin of the Christmas tree, that the Germans were worshiping trees and St. Boniface cut one down uh, to prove to them that it was not divine and that uh, he made it the symbol of Christ. See, so uh, the, uh, I mean, I don't know if that is true, but that, that's a really different story. But, you know, there, there are many cases in the history of the Catholic Church uh, in which the, the Church tries to, as much as possible, salvage what is, what is in their various beliefs. And really, there's no argument about that. But here, uh, and again, with the interpretation of the praxis, that is the practice, the ecumenical practice that has gone on since the Council, I think this takes on a whole new meaning, that these uh, religions are, in the modernist sense, holy, that they, uh, while they might have certain elements of error in them, nevertheless, they are sanctifying religions, and they are paths to God in their own way. And although they're not ecclesial communities and, and so forth, they don't have baptism, uh, they uh, nevertheless have a spiritual value. Uh, all of the meetings, uh, the ecumenical meetings with Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims uh, have uh, ha have really communicated that message. I suppose all the, the, the three Assisi meetings are, as you say, the praxis, the fruits of, of these speculations in this document. Yes, yes. And the official practice, I mean, this is not some sort of uh, renegade priest doing this. These are official acts. It's the spirit of Assisi that was uh, that was so praised by Benedict XVI, uh, and when he redid the Assisi 25 years later, uh, I mean, these are official acts, and they give credibility to the unorthodox interpretation that we are giving to this document. Yeah. I remember my Lord, when I was converting originally to the Novus Ordo, uh, and it was re going through the the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, but I started to come across things that just didn't sound quite right. And I remember one of the things uh, that we talked about in our, uh, our CIA classes, our, um, right for the Christian initiation of adults, yes. uh, was the fact that, you know, the church has great respect for our Muslim brethren. You know, their religion is almost identical to us. And a few minor points, like the fact that they don't believe that Christ was God, uh, and a few things like that. Uh, which yes, sounds kind of like strange. that. <laughs> yeah. uh, we worship the same God. It, it says in section three, the church has a high regard for Muslims. And they, in fact, quote a letter of Gregory the Seventh to uh, Ansir Nasir, the king of Marisania, uh to pr prove this. Is this indeed the purely not quite there? Or are they actually onto something? Is there a, a long tradition of assuming that there's a relationship with Islam? No, I checked that. Uh, it, uh, it took me a long time to check that reference in Gregory the Seventh. Uh, it was a letter to this some sort of potentate in North Africa, uh, in which he was trying to convince him to enter into a type of uh, alliance with the Europeans and the, the uh, Catholics in Europe to overcome some of the tribes to the south who were. <laughs> disturbing something, and I forget what it was, but mm. they were being nasty, and he wanted this sultan or whatever he was to enter into a relationship with the, uh, a type of military or uh, alliance uh, against these the troublesome tribes, and he cited as a motive for entering into this relationship that we worship one god. Mm. Now, unum deum, I looked at it in Latin. I mean, it, it, I checked this out. So, the, you know, there is a big difference between worshipping one God and worshipping one and the same God. True. Uh, you know, it would be like saying, we both have dogs. You know, we both have a dog. You have one dog. I have one dog. But it's not the same dog. You see, it... And, and I think Gregory was saying, well, we have something in common. At least we're not polytheists like these tribes are. And we worship one God. Well, you know, they tried to make great hay of that. Gregory the Seventh, you couldn't get somebody better than Gregory the Seventh 
to say that we are <laughs> worshiping the same God. <laughs> that, that, that is sterling silver as far as a reference. So, but it really, he, he was not, he did not say, unum eudem que deum. Yeah. He said, we both worship one God. And he was, uh, in contrast, polytheist. And um, so, you know, it really is nothing for them. Uh, the uh, obviously we do not worship the same God because the God that we worship has a son, and the God that they worship does not have a son. So it could not possibly be the same God. If if I know a Mr. Smith, and and you know a Mr. Smith, and the one that I know has a son, and the one that you know does not have a son, I would say, well, they, these are not the same people then. To uh, you know, to say that you know, two two religions are monotheistic does not mean that it's the same God. God has certain attributes, and unless you concur in all of those attributes, uh, you do not worship the same God. It's something like this new technology with the face. Every face, uh, you know, they can put certain points on every face, and if one of those points is off, they would say, "Well, this is not the same person because these points do not line up exactly." And so also, if all of the attributes of God do not line up exactly between two religions, you would have to say that there are two different gods. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, they, they deal very briefly with Islam then, and then they move on to... Uh, and I must say, when reading, reading uh, the document on the relationship of Christians and Jews, it, it seems to say at the level of generalities. There doesn't seem to be anything which is objectively wrong uh, here. It's just the, the various things they don't talk about. So they say some things, but they miss out other things. And maybe that's another feature of, of the documents generally that, that we, we could talk about, what they don't say and what they do say. Yes, yes. It's, um, yeah, they're talking around a very delicate issue there, and they are, uh, of course, trying to make an ecumenical basis for a relationship with the Jews. Uh, and and we know where that has gone, where Ratzinger is, is even said as cardinal and John Paul II approving, that they have a separate path to God, that they need not belong to the New Testament, that, that, that their Old Testament is still valid. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, I mean, that, that's where that's going. Uh, and again, that's official interpretation. That's not something cooked up by some crazy theologian. That's official interpretation. I've and, heard people uh, describe that it actually is apostasy rather than simply heresy. Is, is, the, is there some accuracy in that description? <laughs> I'd say that I didn't catch that. Just ask me that question. Some people have said that this idea that we shouldn't be converting Jews because they have their own way to God is actually a form of apostasy from the Christian faith. Yes, it is. Rather, it is apostasy. Yeah. To say that there is someone exempt from mm. the New Covenant, the New Testament, someone, uh, therefore there is someone that need not be redeemed. That is not in, in need of the blood of Christ and of baptism uh, is apostasy. Absolutely, it is the repudiation of the whole Catholic religion. Absolutely, it is. And uh, you know the so we know what these obscure statements in Nostra Aetate are, where they're going yeah. from from the subsequent interpretation given by statements and practice too. All of the uh, overtures to the you know, ecumenical overtures to Jews uh, in, you know, over the past 50 years uh, ha have uh, confirmed that interpretation. Thank you, my lord. I don't, I don't have any more questions on Australia. I wonder if there's anything else that I missed that perhaps you would uh, wish to raise. No, just there is this, uh, you know, the, I remember when that document came out, there was so much publicity by, by saying the church says that the Jews are not responsible for the death of Christ. And that was very much discussed. Uh, the, um, I never saw any document that says that the Jews are responsible for the death of Christ. And I, I didn't understand it. At the time, I, I thought, why are they saying this? We were never taught this in catechisms, uh, that the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. And, and by that, I mean the present-day Jews. Obviously, the, the Jews at the time who called for his death were responsible. And St. Peter says that two times, I believe, in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, but I'm talking about present-day Jews, that, that there is a guilt upon them uh, for the death of Christ. I never saw that in any document of the church. 
uh, you know, perhaps the fathers here and there, but I, you know, but I've never seen that as as doctrine, and I never understood why that was such a uh, something that was uh, so important for for so many people. I mean, the, the church has never been uh, an enemy uh, of the Jewish people as a people, and has always sought their conversion, and has always uh, been. Uh, uh, charitable toward them when they have been persecuted, always condemned the various persecutions that they underwent in medieval Europe. And, uh, but on the other hand, did take steps in her history to uh, protect Catholic society from any sort of uh, anti-Catholic activity on their part. So, I mean, but the church has never been the fomenter of the idea that that uh, Jews should be maltreated for some reason because they're guilty of the death of Christ. Uh, it just is not true. Well, you're actually, I think we are, we're going to continue this, this idea of talking about the non, the, the non-Christian religions and transition back to ecumenism, because we have a couple, I could say ecumenical questions that are being posed to you. Yep. Um, so uh, the first question, well, I just ask them together because they're, they're related. How are Roman Catholic traditionalists substantially different from Holy Orthodoxy? Is not Orthodoxy the true Catholic Church? And why would we draw the line at Vatican II? How do we know that innovation didn't start earlier, as the Orthodox argue? Uh, so Holy, by, but what he means by Holy Orthodoxy there, I assume he means schismatics, like I'm assu- schismatics. Yeah, I was. I'm assuming he's Orthodox. That the asker of the question is is clearly asking it as a member of the Orthodox religion well the uh ultimately it gets down to the conformity uh to previously defined doctrine uh the uh it the uh how should I, this really is the question of do we uh accept vatican ii as as uh valid and and correct and orthodox uh because it is promulgated by a pope or do we see that vatican ii contradicts catholic doctrine and therefore we say that there's something wrong with the pope and the bishops who who promulgated it which comes first uh, apostolic authority or the faith that's the the uh the question there and there's, and the answer is the faith and the reason is that we know apostolic authority through the faith. And so once the faith is preached to us, we are obliged by that virtue to compare every single thing that we hear to the faith and judge it in the light of the faith. Every single thing that we hear, if, if the people on, on the bus should talk to us, every single thing that we hear from them must be judged in the light of the faith as the as what is absolutely true. And that's why St. Paul says that if I, meaning I, the apostle, having obviously apostolic authority, or an angel from heaven should come and say to you, give you a gospel, which is different from what I have preached to you, let him be anathema. And then he repeats it. This is in the first chapter of Galatians. He repeats it. Let him be anathema. He says the same thing again uh, to the Galatians indicating that once their faith is established, it is unchangeable by anybody. And so the church itself is bound to its previous definitions. Uh, The Pope himself is bound to the previous definitions, uh, and he is not free to alter them. So what has primacy is the ascent of faith to dogma. If someone contradicts that dogma, he obviously... Uh, falls in the case uh, of authority he, he falls from authority uh, and uh, because the the, uh, the nature of authority is to confirm the doctrine and to uphold the doctrine and it is essentially contrary to the authority to promulgate something false and contrary to Catholic dogma so the the uh, the difference between say the the schism of the east and and what we're doing is big. First of all, the schism of the East started out as a schism. That is a refusal to accept the authority of the Roman pontiff. Their doctrinal deviation came after the schism. 
but it, they, you know, this is not a question of of challenging the authority of the Roman Pontiff. Not at all. We are all traditionalists are totally submitted to the authority of the Roman Pontiff. This is a question of whether the Roman Pontiff is teaching the Catholic faith in conformity with what has always been taught. That has really nothing to do with the Greek schism. So you know that's what I would respond to him. Uh, and all of their doctrinal issues with Rome have been over the authority of the Roman Pontiff to be the the authentic promulgator of of the Catholic faith. And uh, it, it uh, even Filioque is that you know whether he has the authority uh, to to determine the creed of the Catholic Church. And of course, they would say he can't do that without a council. Uh, and this is not true. The Roman pontiff is not, not obliged to call any council. Even if there had been no councils in the church, he still would have that authority. Uh, mm. And uh, But can he determine the creed contrary to what has been already determined? Obviously not, because he is bound to it. Now, of course, they will respond, well, Filioque was contrary to what was already taught and that's not true it was not contrary to anything there was uh, as a matter of fact uh, i mean it was not not didn't contradict anything in the previous creeds uh nicaea for example added many things that were not in the apostles creed it did not contradict anything but it added a lot the yeah. athanasian creed which is commonly considered a creed in, in the church adds a great deal does not contradict but it adds a great deal um various other professions of faith um uh, uh say uh, much more than the nicaea uh constantinople uh, added to nicaea uh so i mean there there is a progress in the formulation of the doctrines of the faith and the Roman pontiff is ultimately responsible in that and has the ultimate authority in that. Uh, and, but he can never contradict. And that, that's the essence of this. Is this contradiction? Is, the, is Vatican II Roman Catholicism or not? And, and uh, so that's how I would respond, that, that this really has nothing to do with papal authority, nothing whatever to do with papal authority, nothing whatever to do with his ability to augment uh, dogmatic formulas by by uh, by new formulas which are totally in accordance with the previous one. No, no discussion about that at all. This is a question of whether it contradicts, and if it contradicts, it's dead. It's finished. Vatican II is dead in the water if historically it has contradicted the teaching of the Catholic Church. And I think that the 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 modernist authorities, the the you know the Benedict on down, are shaking in their boots over that. That people are noticing, historians and so forth are noticing that that Vatican II contradicts the teaching of the Catholic Church. If that is, and that's why they want this this hermeneutic of continuity to save the baby of Vatican II, to save this objection of the Catholic Church, this conformity of the Catholic Church to the modern world. They see the shambles that the Catholic Church is in. They see people questioning Vatican II, and I think they are shaking in their boots about what the future of Vatican II is. There's a there's a very good article with the title "Saving the Baby," Your Excellency. I, I don't know who wrote that, but uh, well, some very intelligent in- man, I think, who wrote that. <laughs> if anyone's interested in that article, I'll be posting it to Twitter here in a moment. It was something uh, His Excellency wrote uh, in 2006. Um, it was part of the seminary newsletter, which you get for free if you make a donation to Most Holy Trinity Seminary, um, which of course will give. His Excellency, a chance to speak a little bit about the seminary at some point as well, uh, because a rector does have to, uh, to mention that from time to time. This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org. Oh.